What's up, guys? Welcome to the biggest pipsqueaks in the UFC tier list. We are going to be using a tier list to rank these guys. S tier being the guys that are just total pipsqueaks that are not intimidating. You, you can't necessarily take them serious. You, you're almost thinking to yourself, man, who does this guy think he is? <laughs> you know what I mean? D tier, it's like, all right, you know, he, he's not the scariest dude, but I wouldn't necessarily say he's a pipsqueak. Which a good example of that would be Wonder Boy. I think Wonder Boy is D tier pipsqueak. Now he's not F tier. He's he's not totally free of making the list. Now Wonder Boy, you're on the list because you know he's Mister Friendly. He's Mister Smiley Pants, and you can't be doing all that, man. And and if I feel like I could take a spinning wheel kick to the face from Wonder Boy and not get KO'd, this guy has no sting. This is the only dude in the UFC to land the most. Powerful, aside from Paulo Costa, the only dude in the UFC that could land the most powerful techniques and have the same effect as landing a little pitter-pat jab that just grazes you. So, he's Mr. Smiley Pants. He does a bunch of buddy-buddy handshakes in the cage. If he has someone hurt, instead of actually following up and viciously beating them down, Wonderboy Thompson's nodding at them saying, come on, buddy, get up, buddy. And they're doing little handshakes. So, I got to put him in the detail. And I guess the last thing I need to say about Wonderboy is... Threat levels, I know Wonder Boy would toast me. And and this is the thing. I make fun of Wonder Boy's power, but I just still can't help but feel like if I was to get in a fight with Wonder Boy, I'd make it to decision. I just can't not help but feel that way. I know in reality, he'd probably slip me on to like a really perfect technique that I wouldn't see coming because I'm not skilled enough to see it coming, unlike these professional fighters that he's fighting, and he'd probably knock me out. But I'm just saying threat levels, they don't seem all there. Similarly, when we actually get to a real pipsqueak like Sean O'Malley, O'Malley, you know, he is dangerous. He would be able to knock me out. But you just look at the guy and I'm sorry, man. I'm, I just don't think that this dude is a threat. All right. I don't think he's a menace. I don't think he's a threat. There's a reason why when the bouncers are in the club and something goes off, something pops off, they're pushing O'Malley out of the way to get to Schmitty. They think Schmitty's the fucking world champ. And O'Malley, the dude ain't got charisma. Tim Welch gets more pop in the club, bro. Tim Welch walks into the club looking like Canelo. And there are people lining up for him. And then there's O'Malley that's running around with, with this freaking 140 pounds soaking wet in the cage physique. O'Malley's like 140 in the cage. <laughs> I'm joking. I actually think he's like 152. O'Malley would smoke me. He would KO me stiff. I'm under... No delusion. O'Malley would beat me up in a fight. He's a great fighter. It's, his pipsqueak levels have been declining. I will give him that. He was S-tier before. We, you know, we think of O'Malley as the guy that's body is going to fall apart. We were expecting in the fifth round, Cheeto's going to be bullying him a little bit. Cheeto's going to be punking him. But O'Malley held up. He held up. His hands didn't start breaking. His legs didn't start quaking. He was good. So I give O'Malley some credit, and maybe if he gets another gritty performance in, another tough guy performance, we could put him in the B tier, and, and we'll slowly start to think differently about him. But at the end of the day, we're just going to have to say it how it is. O'Malley's a pipsqueak, okay? Waldo, Cost Waldo Acosta Cortez. So this is the guy that's about to get smoked by Rebellus to Spain, a Rebellus to Spain victim in the making. But why do I call him a pipsqueak? Well, first of all, Waldo Acosta Cortez is a heavyweight. And unlike some of these other heavyweights that are like fighting in a weight class that's five times too big for them, he's fighting at a weight class that's maybe uh, one or two times too big for him. But he's a heavyweight that's out here styling on Andre, the crafty vet, the loved veteran Arlovsky, who wouldn't harm a fly, the, the nicest man in the world. You got Waldo Acosta Cortez. Mean mugging him in between rounds, doing the Robbie Lawler, Rory McDonald face off, trying to like punk him in the cage, trying to show him what's what. And this guy has no power in his hands. He's not slinging leather. He's not winning the fight clearly. It's like a razor close fight. And you got this guy acting like, you know, he, he, he he's the fucking man in front of Andre Olaski. Dude, you ain't got no power. Sorry. Couldn't harm a fly. Couldn't knock out anyone. If you're sitting in front of Andre Orlovsky and you're trying to style on him, but you're still too scared to actually go after the KO, that's the thing that I've said in the past. If you want to actually do something impressive and get somewhere in the heavyweight division, you finish Andre Orlovsky. Everyone that's finished Andre Orlovsky has gotten a reward after. 
because it's not that easy to do, but he's not dangerous. And this is why I always differentiate between imposing your will. That is the biggest thing that, that decides on whether you're going to become ranked. Imposing your will on Andre Orlovsky means, dude, fuck all this. This dude ain't got no power. He might have some crafty head movement and whatnot. He's a tough out. I'm going to go for the KO. Like, okay, what's the worst that can happen? Andre Orlovsky KOs me? That's so unlikely. But I'm going to take that risk. And I'm going to put this dude's lights out. This guy, Waldo with Cortez Costa, I'm sorry for, for butchering his name, but you can do all the styling and all the emoting you want. At the end of the day, you were too scared to actually put your foot on the fucking gas and finish this man. All right? So that's, how, that's almost worst. I'd rather, as a heavyweight prospect, get knocked out by the old man Orlovsky trying to finish the fight than go to a decision with him, especially thinking I'm emoting on the guy and gaining fans' respect. This dude thought we were going to be making edits off of him. Yeah, we will soon when Rebellus puts him into the Shadow Realm, but... Now let's get to it. Let's get down to the S tier. Kai Kara France. I gotta say it. I mean, the guy's just not scary. You face off with this dude and you want to sing a Jingle Bell song. You want to sing a Christmas carol. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Kai Kara France is on the shelf, you know, dancing all the way. You can wear the supreme clothes. You can wear the bathing ape. You can have all the J's you have. But I'm gonna just have to say it. Kai Kara France is the definition of a pipsqueak, okay? First of all, He's got this whole hype beast thing going on. The dude's rocking Supreme and Bathing Ape and Dulce and Gobana and all this stuff. And he, he's a sneakerhead. He's got all the fresh J's. At a certain point, you got to grow up. Okay, you got to grow up. He dresses like an elf. <laughs> this dude literally dresses like an elf. He's an elf on the shelf. He's literally one of those things you, you put on your shelf during Christmas time and you switch it up. You switch up the locations. Kai Kara France is that dude. You know, he's wearing this little feather cap, this little green vest looking like it's straight out of Peter Pan's closet. And this guy's trying to do the whole, I'll cut your neck off at his weigh-ins. I can't take it serious. I just can't take it serious at all. I'm sorry. And I love how, you know, this guy thinks that we're going to put him in edits because of that stuff. I'll cut your neck. He thinks Rogan's going to be talking about him like he used to talk about Chuck Liddell having these great white shark eyes. Rogan was like, I don't think people understand. How savage Chuck Liddell is. He thinks we're going to be saying that about Cow Cow France. This dude's Maori. Whoa. No, man. And CKB, Izzy talks about Kai Kara France like he's... <laughs> Izzy talks about Ma Kai Kara France like he's Muhammad Ali. The freaking reverence in which he speaks about Kai Kara. As if Kai Kara paved the way. Kai Kara paved the way. This dude's like 28 years old. He just got into the UFC <laughs> a couple of years ago. This dude's a freaking naughty elf from Santa Shelf. Another guy that's a pipsqueak, Nate Diaz. I know this is a dude that's totally different than Kai Kara France, but it's kind of the same. It's like, dude has a personality based on, I'm tough. Yeah. It's like, this guy slapped the, the full send MMA reporter and you could see him in the background flexing on, yeah, what, what? Like, you're a pipsqueak, man. You're built like tofu. This dude's got a tofu build. He looks like, like if, if this was a shoving in a locker competition, you're shoving Nate Diaz into that locker. Now, he might get out and beat your ass. Nate Diaz might choke you out, dude. Like, you don't want to say it to him in person, but I, I almost feel tempted to. Am I the only one? Like, this, who does this guy think he is? He just, this dude is like a, a, a seventh grader with the way he gets into fights. He has no emotional control. Okay? Who does this guy, he's a grown man. And he's getting into fights like this is middle school hallways? Are you kidding me? What's going on? Nate Diaz. You gotta get a grip. This dude's like 42 years old. And he hangs out with a bunch of pipsqueaks and they all wear black and they're all in their 40s. That is not a scary sight. That's just a laugh. The Nate Diaz army. The Nate Diaz army beats you up. You get, you get a couple of bips and bops. You get a couple of bruises. But they're not going to put you out. It's not a dangerous situation, you know what I mean? It's almost like an experience to get beat up by Nate Diaz. Where it's like, dude, Nate, yeah, I guess it's just a thing. Everyone gets beat up backstage by Nate Diaz. The reporters, Dana White, everyone gets slapped around by Nate. It's just another day at the office. It's not the most dangerous thing. Now, of course, he, he, might, he might get the guillotine. He might sleep you out. And I'm not saying I would press Nate Diaz. I'm not. But what I'm saying is I almost feel like someone needs to just because it's... <laughs> I just think that he needs a reality check. Like, he needs to understand shit. Like, I'm 40. I can't be doing this. Whatever. <laughs> Nate Diaz. You know, 
Anyway, he's got no power, and he's never won a five-rounder in his life. People talk about... Oh, he... I mean, technically, he beat Connor in a five-rounder, but... People talk about Nate Diaz in these five-rounders. Okay, g give me a time where the fifth round benefited Nate. You could say that the Nate Leon Edwards won, for example. He had one moment. He had one moment. And, and people always say, if it was you and Nate fighting over a bone, Nate Diaz is getting that. Well, that's not the sport. That's like Cheeto Vera saying, you know, I, I finished O'Malley last time. I'd be going to jail if this actually were to not have a time limit in the rematch it's like no that doesn't matter like you had 25 minutes 25 minutes that's almost a half an hour of fighting and you're making complaints because you got your fucking ass whooped saying that if there was no time limit dude that that basically is no time limit on to the next one yair rodriguez i'm gonna put yair in the b tier now listen i think he's getting a lot better personality wise attitude wise he used to run around as if he was little lord fauntroy the, the prince of the UFC getting whatever he wants from Dana White, especially after he got that Ortega win. He was bouncing off of a loss to Max Holloway, got his ass beat on the ground against Max, gets a weird anticlimactic win against Ortega, and he's acting like he deserves the title shot. Given them, or in, in, in your mind, if, say, Alex isn't ready for the rest of the year, are you willing to wait for Alex, or would you be willing to, like, maybe fight for an interim title or yeah, something I'm else? I'm waiting. I'm waiting for him. It was almost as if it was disrespectful to even bring up fighting anyone other than Volkanovski at the time. But he came back, he fought Josh Emmett, and he seemed to have a better attitude. But now, the reason why he's still on this list is just because he's just such a flimsy guy when it comes to the wrestling. He's got no ability to stuff a takedown, he's not strong. And it's weird because he's so fast and dynamic and dangerous on the feet. But once you get a hold of this guy, you're taking him down. Okay, you're pushing him to the ground. And he's just not really got anything to defend himself when it comes to stuffing a takedown. Now, he can put guys in a bit of an issue. He could sub guys off of his back. But against the top 10, he's not going to be able to do that. And those are the people that he's going to be fighting anyway. So I got to say on the ground, he's a little bit of a pushover. On to the next guy, though. Now, respect to Chris Dawkins. He's no longer in the UFC. But this guy was a featherweight fighting at heavyweight. Okay, and although Chris Dawkins, I believe, is like 6'2", and he's like 245 pounds, I think he should have dropped to 155. I honestly think that 155 would have been a good fit for him. But he was always fighting in the bigger weight class. It was like a smaller man fighting in a bigger man's body. It doesn't change the fact that you're a smaller man. And he didn't go about it by bloat maxing or density maxing. I don't even know how to say it. I just think he was out of shape. I think that there are some guys that can put on some serious mass and dense muscle where, you know, they have a belly, they have a gut like Daniel Cormier, but it's like, you know, it's it's popping. It's not just everything's flabbing all around and, and flapping. And he's, the dude could have flown away with the flabs that he had. You know, he's like Dumbo, except it wasn't the ears. It was his rolls. And <laughs> I think that Dawkins... He just had no power. He had no sting. He was LARPing as a heavyweight. And for that reason, I think you kind of have to call him out and say, dude, you're a pipsqueak in this division. And I hope he comes back to the UFC at 155 pounds. But yeah, uh, Javid Basharat. Now, attitude wise, he's not a pipsqueak other than the fact that he kind of just goes out there and does a whole bunch of pitter patting around on the feet. And he's not like a dangerous man on the feet. But you know, as soon as you actually have some takedown defense and some basics, you could just march across the octagon and just put it on this guy at the end of the day. He's not dangerous. He's not powerful. The hardcore fans were hyping him up as if he was the second coming. Of course, you know, they see the, they see the name Bashrat and it's so foreign. It's like, whoa, he's like Middle Eastern and he's got a beard and he's got the takedowns. And this is the, the Middle Eastern Habib. When in reality, he's just a... A pillow hand to do that can't impose his will on the feet and is very one-dimensional when it comes to his game which is really the only thing he's actually solid at is his grappling and we saw Eamon Zahabi who's an old crafty vet but not even a crafty vet in the UFC just kind of a crafty vet at TriStar Gym you know he's like solid but he's not gonna he's not like Paul Harris that's just ripping dudes up I mean Eamon Zahabi's just like a regular guy at the dojo essentially <laughs> and Eamon Zahabi just hit down on the mouthpiece and fucking went after this guy and, and ended up beating him. And I was really happy. But yeah, I got to say, Basharat, bit of a pipsqueak. It's Corey Sandhagen. Now, I'm going to put Corey Sandhagen in the B tier. First of all, we know the dude is built like a pipsqueak. He's like six foot two. 
in the bantamweight division, 135 pounds. Augusta Wind is Corey Sanhagen's nightmare. That's obvious, but that's not the main reason. You know, this guy, he talks as if this is a freaking science test. He's bringing the lab coats and the beakers and the test tubes. Corey Sanhagen's fight IQ, it may be off the charts, but let's not forget that this is a fight. Let's not forget that we're really throwing hands. You can have all the philosophy up here. You can have read all the books you want. At the end of the day, you're in a fight. And sometimes, we just have to be honest with this. Corey Sanhagen's not the most dangerous fighter in the bantamweight division. And this is what I mean. Although he can flying knee KO people, although he could pick people apart, no math equation is going to allow Corey Sanhagen to whoop O'Malley's ass on the feet. Now, I know O'Malley's in the A tier for attitude reasons. Corey Sanhagen's one of my favorite fighters. I love the guy. He's really fun to watch. He has an entertaining style. He's excellent. And I like the guy's personality too. He, he He's so passionate about the game. He's so obsessed with getting better. And I like the guy's mentality. He's striving for excellence. But at the end of the day, people talk about Corey Sandhagen and they'll say things like Corey Sandhagen in two if he's fighting Umar Nurmagomedov. Sandhagen knocks him out one round, dude. Who do you think this guy is? That They talk about him like this is Francis Ngannou sometimes. Like, he doesn't knock anyone out unless it's an old jitterbug with no chin like Frankie Edgar. When he's up against guys in their prime, you know, he, he's long and rangy and he's snapping out that long wiry jab, but he's not necessarily knocking dudes dead. And that's fine. That's okay. You don't have to. He's still a good fighter. He still can hurt people. And maybe he could have like a Max Holloway, Calvin Cater moment at some point in his career if he's given the right opponent. But I think the right opponent would have been Cheeto. You know how all these O'Malley fans will say things like, dude, people are giving O'Malley way too much credit for beating up Cheeto Vera. He's a punching bag. Uh, no one has made Cheeto Vera look like that. The closest anyone's ever got was Rob Font. But Rob Font didn't scratch or bruise up or rock or like break the face of Cheeto Vera. Rob Font has pillow hands. Corey Sandhagen was maybe landing like 25 strikes around some of them were like these little pitter-pat low kicks, and he landed some good uppercuts, and he landed some great body shots, and he definitely outclassed Cheeto. But this dude was given the opponent where people these days are saying that dude's a punching bag, and he didn't necessarily make him look like a punching bag. I mean, it was kind of like a regular output style of fight for Corey, where he's so good, and he definitely does get the better of Cheeto, of course. But, you know, I just don't think he's as dangerous as some people like to say he is when i hear people say shit like oh he finishes zumar in two rounds really how how does he finish him and also Corey sandhagen gives up his back easily and when you're able to get muscled around on the ground it's kind of a bad look and it's not the sturdiest thing Corey sandhagen the reason i pick umar to beat him i think Corey's obviously the better striker but i just think that umar the big bantamweight that he is Versus the very unstable build of Corey, who's, you know, he's he's durable, he's tough, he's a smart fighter, but you get your hands on the guy and it's like, wait a second, I, I, I could do something with this, I could do something with this, and I think that Umar would be able to take his back. Uh, similar thing to Brandon Royval, you look at how easily he was able to get held down by Alexander Pantoja, that's what I'm saying. Listen, I like Brandon Royval, but... It's almost as if he's walking around like he's not a pipsqueak. The dude's 5'9". He's not even that short for this flyweight division. He's like a tall flyweight. He's built like tofu, man. You know, we talk about Nate Diaz. And if, if you could shove him into a locker, you probably would. Now he's getting out and he's whooping your ass. I don't know if Royval could get out. That's all I'm saying. It's like he might not be strong enough to open the locker. But at the end of the day, Royval, I like the way he fights. He took it to Moreno. It was him and Moreno in a battle of, okay, who's actually going to go for this one? Who wants it more? And he wanted it more. So I respect that. But his build, the power, the lack of thereof, it's just something you can't not pass up. So I do think that Brandon Royval is a bit of a pipsqueak. But I'll put him in the B tier because he doesn't have a bad attitude. Um, Chris Curtis. You know, Chris Curtis is only by attitude a pipsqueak you know what i mean because i almost feel like if i were to get in the cage with chris curtis now this is delusional and this is stupid because chris curtis would not fear me at all and i'm not skilled enough to be able to hang out on the outside and pick and prod with long rangey kicks and body kick and move and stick and move i'm not jack hermanson 
but I almost that you give me some time training you, you give me a warm-up session on the pads I think I might be able to go out there kick the calf of Chris Curtis and stake a move tape him to the body little body kicks change you off on the angle you know, I, I think I might be able to frustrate him. And the next thing you know, there's Chris Curtis throwing a tantrum in the middle of the cage. Guy's got a bad attitude. All right. He doesn't want to take responsibility for the fact that he's losing in these fights. Like, you know, you're the one standing in the middle of the cage saying, hey, hey, come on, come on. They're not just going to get in your face and fight you like Marc-Andre Barriou. That's what Chris Curtis wants. Chris Curtis wants to lock horns in the middle of the cage or swing big meaty hooks. All right. Big bruiser style of punches. Okay. You, you got to be able to adjust. Ian Gary, man. I might have to put Ian Gary in the beat tier, and this is why. Now, although Ian Gary imposes his will, and he's a good fighter, he's entertaining, he goes after it. People were giving him a lot of crap for the Jeff Neal fight, but I saw at least 10 moments where Ian Gary would crash with Jeff Neal and, like, go in with a knee. Like, this dude would literally close the distance, step in knee to the body elbow off the break, punch off the break. Like he was moving forward on Jeff Neal, getting in, getting out, getting in, getting out. It wasn't just a on the outside the whole time performance. He's a good fighter. He's entertaining. He doesn't have a lot of sting in his shots, but he's not necessarily built like a guy that you would necessarily be scared of. Now he's got a bit of a pee head and I, I hate to say it, but it's true. He is deteriorating before our eyes, physique-wise, fight to fight. And that is because his vegan diet. I think Ian Gary's only been vegan for a couple of years. But you look at his cage weight against Jeff Neal. Jeff Neal, by the way, was like 200 pounds in the cage. Not an exaggeration. Ian Gary was 180. If you know anything about weight cutting and how much people usually blow up at the elite level, it's usually like 15 pounds. Ian Gary, 10 pounds in the cage, 10 pounds extra from weigh-ins. You could basically fight at lightweight. Colby Covington's probably more than that. Colby Covington, I think, walks around at like 190. Everyone talks about Colby as if he's like walking around at 170. Listen to any of his interviews that he had in the build-up to the uh, UFC London card where Usman fought Leon in the rematch, or the trilogy, I should say. And Colby was talking about how he had to cut like 20-plus pounds. Colby Covington in the cage is probably like 185, okay? Most of these welterweights are like 195 in the cage, right? Ian Gary, dude was like 179. That's because he's losing muscle. He's losing mass. And I think, honestly, he needs to start eating meat again. It would be good for him. He would at least be able to maintain more muscle during his weight cuts. Or he should drop to lightweight. Because either way, he's going to keep getting smaller. And his physique in general is deteriorating. So he's got a bit of a tofu build at this point. Even when he's cutting weight, he's not that lean and shredded. He's lean, but it's almost like a bloated, watery look where he doesn't have, like, thin skin because everything's just bloated because of all the all the fiber and, and all the, the, the water he's holding from on the, all the potatoes and leeks and shit that he's eating. So he's built like a bit of a pipsqueak, okay? But he's not on that Kai Kara France level. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Until next time. What's up, everybody? My name is Lucas Tracy MMA and it's time to introduce you to something that you may not know. And what you may not know, <laughs> what you may not know, son, is that it's summer. Oh, well, it's almost summer. And you've got a couple options. One option, you can sit around and look like a blob. Nobody wants to look like a blob. But you can get in shape even if you do look like a blob. It doesn't have to be a way of life. And so what I recommend is I recommend hopping on that Real Food Cookbook, which has a 60-day shred inside of it, which is an entire weight loss program within my cookbook. And I also recommend using code MMA for 30% off, all right? This is an unreal deal if you want some recipes made with whole and unprocessed foods to allow you to eat some hearty, hearty foods while losing weight. So guys, Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for tuning in.